Well, welcome all you wiretappers out there back here in the studio of Gangland Wire. As you can see, I don't know why I say that each time. I'm going to look at the Dallas family. Now, Dallas, you know, was part of the Midwest families, although Dallas was, they weren't really connected to Kansas City or Chicago. They were more connected, if anybody, to Carlos Marcelo down in uh, New Orleans. You know, Southern people, there's a little bit of action down in Houston. Had a, a, a regular family in uh, Dallas. Uh, the first man who be like the godfather, shall we say, the first one from Sicily was a Carlo Piranio. Carlo Pirano came to the United States from Sicily in 1901 with his brother Joseph, who will work with him and become his underboss as he forms a family. They first settled in Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, which is real close to Dallas. I don't know if you know how close that is, but it's real close. He began the Dallas faction in 1921 with Joseph at his under, as his underboss. He will be described as mob historians look back as the original head of the mafia in Texas. Carlo Piranio was born in Corleone, Sicily in 1876, and the same hometown as one of the early New York bosses, Giuseppe Morello. He married Carlo Piranio, married an 18-year-old Italian girl in 1903. They had a son, Angelo, in 1904. By the time Carlo and his brother Joseph moved to Dallas, uh, it was probably 1905, 6, after Angelo was born. The April 1910 census says that the family lived temporarily at 7744 Main Street in Dallas. Uh, that household had Carlo and Clemencia which would be the young 18-year-old girl from Sicily that he married, his son, Angelo, and his brother, Joseph Pranio, and his bride, Lena. Carlo ran a real estate business out of his house, and Joseph worked as a grocery salesman, supposedly. Uh, Joseph wasn't really settled in Texas. He moved back to Louisiana for a while, and then by 1914-15, he and his family came back to Dallas. Prohibition takes off, and of course, they start getting into that and bootlegging and, and running speakeasies and, and organizing all that all the way up to the Midwest. Everybody did throughout the whole United States. You know, that's the, the mother's milk for the mafia throughout the whole United States. You know, the National Crime Syndicate, as we became to know it to by the 80s and 90s, was formed out of prohibition. Carlo dies of natural causes in 1930, and Joseph takes over the family. and becomes a boss. He owned a lot of bars and gambling operations, of course, and some labor rackets in construction business, and which is big in, in Dallas over the years. His underboss was a Joseph Savello. Joseph Savello was born in 1902, and he was a native born. He was born in West, West Baton Rouge Parish, Louisiana. And Baton Rouge is even closer to New Orleans and, and really almost part of New Orleans. So definitely connections back to the New Orleans family. His father was a farm laborer and came to the United States around 1900 and had a whole bunch of brothers and sisters. And Joseph Savello's father, took, Philip Savello, took the whole family from West Baton Rouge in 1923 to Dallas, Texas, and he opened a grocery store. And Joseph Savello marries in 1929. He married a woman named Mary and moved into a relative's house in Dallas at 1902 Mosier Avenue. Now, if you Dallas people know where that is, it's you can go by there and see what that, if that's still there even. He worked in his father's grocery store. Joseph Savello moves on up, and he is really the uh, the underboss by this point in time. He's convicted of prohibition violations in 1926, did a little time in jail. Other liquor charges during prohibition, as I said, the whole Dallas family, the Pirano family was involved with prohibition. One time he was part of a series of raids that got 22 bootleggers around the city. Now, see, in the South, in, in Dallas, they're going to be a little crack down a little more on bootleggers and make a lot more arrests than they would in Chicago or Kansas City as further north you get. Joseph Savello was arrested one time with a man named Joe DiCarlo, who was a really important bootlegger in Dallas area. And, and he had been refusing to send tribute payments to Carlo Pirano, to the Pirano family. And Joseph Savello was the guy who was supposed to administer the mob mafia discipline or he's going to go out and crack the whip and, and collect the money. Just a couple of days after Joseph Savello and Joe DiCarlo were arrested together, they were meeting inside a drugstore at the intersection of St. Paul and Bryan Street. It was called the St. Paul Drugstore. 
Savalo just happened to be carrying a loaded sawed off shotgun at the time, and men were standing close to each other, and the shotgun went off. I mean, it just happened to go off. De Carlo, the man who was refusing to pay tribute, was shot in the stomach. Savalo just stayed there at the scene. Cops arrive, and, and he says, hey, he said, I had this gun, but it just went off by accident. And De Carlo, in a dying statement, confirms the story. Yeah, that shotgun went off by accident. He wasn't trying to hurt me. Sabella was arrested and charged with murder. He went to trial, actually went to a grand jury and gave a statement. And they got De Carlo's dying statement and the grand jury released him and and ended up not returning a true bill or indicting Joseph Sabello. Sabella will assume control after the Piranos die off in 1956. Joseph Sabello, to let you know that this was a real family and part of the National Crime Syndicate, he was at the Appalachian meeting in 1957. And that was a time when law enforcement people would say he controlled any narcotics activity, all gambling, any prostitution, and a lot of nightclubs in most of all of Texas. After the Appalachian meeting, the FBI started keeping a closer look at Cive on Civello. 1960, Joseph Civello was indicted for conspiracy and perjury offenses. He was sentenced along with 19 other mob leaders that were at the Appalachian Convention to five years in the penitentiary. U.S. Court of Appeals, as we all know now, overturned those convictions of the men at the Appalachian and, and because they hadn't really proven that there was a conspiracy that was designed to accomplish some unlawful act on this conspiracy. Just because they're meeting together, you can't have a storyteller say why they were meeting together. And, and what this conspiracy was going to be, and then an overt act to in furtherance of that conspiracy, you're not going to get a conviction. Joseph Cervello dies in 1970. Again, he's, uh, he's like the recognized mafia boss of Texas. He was succeeded by probably a guy named Campisi. There was another guy, uh, Joseph Little Joe Iannani, who was, made, was in the organization. Then there was Joseph Campisi. Iannani was a naturalized immigrant from Calabria, Italy, and supposedly a relative of a New York mobster named Rocco Pellegrino. If he was a boss, he wasn't a boss very long because he died of a heart attack three years after Savello did. Joseph Campese was a successful businessman and a Dallas native. Campese had always denied he had any rule in organized crime. Campese had tangled with law enforcement over the years, and the FBI didn't really find any really solid evidence. And, and actually, what they'll decide and officially publish is that after Joseph Savello died, the Dallas family just died clear out. Campisi, I believe he had a restaurant all up in the modern times. An Italian restaurant was a successful uh, restaurant tour. So that's kind of quick, down and dirty review of the Texas and Dallas crime families. Everybody would say over the years that they were really closely connected to uh, Carlos Marcello, which probably they were. But since the boss was at Appalachian, just like Nick Savella was at Appalachian, Nick Savella from Kansas City, leads me to believe, in my opinion, he was his own discreet family. And there was a family that just died out after he died. Don't forget, I like to ride motorcycles and watch out for motorcycles when you're out there in your car. If you have a problem with PTSD or you have a friend or relative does, go to the VA website and get that hotline number and like and subscribe. Give me a review. I don't like asking for that stuff. Anyhow, uh, you know what I mean. Thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate all you guys support your, your comments on YouTube, your, your, uh, uh, reviews. Your uh, buy me a cup of coffee, all that stuff, you know, it all goes to make this thing go. Thanks a lot. This thing go.